by the end of this fundamental analysis course, you'll be able to understand what the complicated jargons that finance people use and then also apply this into your trading. So first thing first, I need you to take out a notebook, pen, paper. So if you have watched my previous fundamental analysis course, this course is sort of like a part two of that. I'm not going to go into intro of FA and bore you with all that stuff. First thing you want to learn, how to master fundamental analysis, okay? Second thing, some factors, important factors you need to know. Fundamentals of USD, Euro, Yen, central banks, monetary policies, fiscal policies, very important. This is what hedge fund managers look at, investment bank traders look at. GDP interest rate, inflation, employment, these are what the big boys look at. Now, if you want to become successful in trading, you want to trade just like the professionals, okay? Then you gotta learn FA. Because what do retail traders like? Technical analysis. The thing is, if you turn on CNBC, Bloomberg, and you don't understand 90% of the things that they are saying, you need to work on this. How to be a good fundamental analyst. First thing first, you need to think long term. Because what drives prices in the long term is fundamentals. What drives prices in the short term is fear and greed. First thing you need to know, first thing you need to do is to have a long term outlook. Stop thinking short term, just like the typical retail trader who only look at technical analysis. So we don't do things like day trading, scalping, we go beyond that, beyond one day, okay? Days, weeks, and up to months, okay? Depending on your trading personality. Basically, have an investor mindset. Second thing, keep up with Kardashian's news. Now, you don't trade the news, but you use it to determine what is the long term movement of the currency and also look at news to determine the overall macro sentiment are people scared or are people optimistic right now because that is going to move certain currencies like safe haven currencies some reliable news resources you can look at you can watch Bloomberg CNBC and then you can read Financial Times Forex Life okay very useful website the more you watch and read about it, the more you get the hang of it. At first, when you read it, you might be a little bit confused, but if you do it again and again every day, make it a habit, eventually, you're going to understand things. Understand what are the drivers in the long term. Basically, what are the long-term drivers of the currency market? Okay, later I'm going to talk more detail about this. Then the next thing is, you got to take note of three things. Okay, when you look at an economic number, observe the absolute number, meaning is it positive or is it negative? Okay, simple as that. Second thing, look at the Delta, which is more important than this one, not the Delta variant COVID-19. Delta is the percentage change, okay, which is very important. Then the next thing you gotta look at is the overall trend of this economic data, okay. For the past six months, six to twelve months, is this economic data going on an uptrend or downtrend, or is it going sideways? And then also look at the number comparing it with expect my whiteboard is not big enough expectations okay now some people will say but those analysts don't know what they're talking about it doesn't matter because this is what markets react to doesn't matter if the data is correct or wrong the market only reacts to what it sees of course, the most important one to become a master in FA. This is where most retail traders lose. Patience. If all you do is come to a guru or a mentor and the first thing you ask is what indicator do you use? It tells me that you're just taking shortcuts. And with that, I want to tell you 
Go back to your jump. Let me go into this. Why is the percentage change more important? Because a lot of times you realize that the data comes out as positive, but yet the currency goes down. It can be due to sentiment factors. If we assume that everything else remains the same, if the percentage number, if the percentage number, why does no it? Okay, try this one. If the percentage number is positive but less than expectations, the currency is still gonna go down. Okay? Even though it's positive but it's less than expectations, it's gonna go down. Some of the important FA factors to take note of. First thing first, economy indicators, okay? There are so many indicators out there, right? Not all of them are important. So you only take note of the important ones later on that talk more about this. Next thing you gotta take note of, political events. It can give you very, very good trades, especially before the election and right after the election. If you know what you're doing, this is almost like free money for you. Next thing you gotta look at, interest rates, okay? Again, more details on this later. Another thing, I know a lot of retail traders don't like this. Inter-market analysis, they just don't like it. Stock prices as well. I'm not talking about individual stock, more like the index, okay? Also look at what the big boys look at and also what are they doing? Because it's going to move the markets. What do they look at and what are they doing, okay? Next thing you gotta look at, credit ratings of the country. Basically, just pick those countries that has good ratings, basically the developed countries, okay? Just to make things simple for you, for now. Currency regimes, I talked about this in the previous course, part one course. So I'm going to skip this one now, okay? Next thing, where is capital flowing in terms of carry trading? Basically, capital and investment flow. What are these two things affected by? Affected by sentiment. This is why you need to learn sentiment analysis. When companies undergo mergers and acquisitions, okay, it's going to affect the currency as well. Repatriation of profits. Because international businesses Let's say I have a US company and I have another branch in Japan and I want to bring my profits back from Japan to my US headquarters. So I need to exchange my yen into USD. Basically all this thing comes down to this one underlying factor which is supply and demand. To put things in simple terms, when the demand for currency increases, the currency is gonna go up when the supply for a currency increases. The currency is gonna go down. And also you can understand one very important factor that is super random which is ad hoc events. Meaning events that are not scheduled into your economic calendar. Basically things that are unpredictable just like your ex. Ad hoc unscheduled events. What are the examples? I'm sorry. Unscheduled events. Okay, example. Disasters, example. Pandemic, example. Wars, okay, these are not predictable. These events are also going to affect sentiment and in turn affect capital and investment flow. And in turn affects carry trading flow. 
which in turn affects the currency. Like I said, you gotta understand what the big boys look at and who are the big boys that are looking at economic indicators. Example, you have the government which looks at example employment data as well as inflationary data. And why is this important to them in particular? Because it is how they are measured, it is their KPI. Like if elections is coming, what are people going to look at? They're going to look at, do I have a job? Do my friends all have a job? So certain economic data tend to become political. So because certain central banks, they act on behalf of the government. So it is kind of their job to manipulate the data a little bit. So one thing to just take note is understand that economic data especially those political ones, can be rigged and manipulated, okay? Also closely watched by hedge funds, bank traders, okay? Of course, you have your central banks, okay? These are the big boys that are looking at economic indicators. And some people might say that Economic indicators might have been priced in, but it is not as fast as what the textbook says because textbook knowledge says that these events price in immediately, okay? But in real fact, they price in gradually. You cannot just rely on one economic data and be like, okay, because GDP is good, so I'm gonna buy this currency and hold long term. No, you gotta evaluate all the important indicators okay some might be negative some might be positive but in overall is it positive or negative don't look at one data in isolation now i'm not talking about scalping again let me remind you because when you're scalping of course you look at one economic data and then you scalp based on that it's a completely different thing what drives the currency market in the long term are a variety of factors, not just one factor. Just like your candlestick patterns, okay? When the context is wrong. The pattern, even though it looks perfect, it wouldn't work out because it's not strong enough. Same thing with economic indicators. If the context is wrong, this important economic indicator is not going to work out. It's not going to move markets at all, okay? Because nobody cares about it. First thing first. What is the business cycle? Or the economic cycle? Are we in an expansion? Are we in a recession? Are we in the early stage or the late stage of an expansion? Recession? When we are in the late stage of an expansion phase, people are going to pay attention to inflation in particularly core inflation why is that because they are going to expect and wait for the fed to increase interest rates okay and when it's a recession then people wouldn't even care about inflation data then they'll start to care about things like unemployment data so learn the business cycle very important and some people might say accuracy i mean this is important but not as important like i said the market reacts to whatever that comes up. The other thing is historical performance. Does this economic indicator behave the way it should behave for the past 50 years, 10 years? Next thing, number of revisions. Certain data like GDP. Advanced report, prelim report, then the final report. The final report, even though it is more accurate because it is revised, again and again and again, it doesn't really move the market. The first report that is released, the first GDP report, it moves the market the most. Because people react to whatever that comes up first. Okay? So if you're expecting that the final GDP report is going to move the market, it's not. Unless there's something super unexpected, but chances are it doesn't really happen that often, so you should pay more attention to whatever that comes out first. And the next thing, 
economic power of a country because if let's say a very small country okay releases an employment data it's not going to move the markets that much as compared to if a very developed country like US they release and employment data is going to affect the whole world and next factor timeliness as well as sample size like I said timeliness the earlier it is released the more it's gonna move the market so that's why data like NFP is so market moving because it is released earlier in the month and other less important factors like media coverage this is why a lot of professional traders they use Bloomberg Terminal because they get the data really fast before it even goes onto TV, onto newspaper. Speaking about strength, okay, you have weak, moderate, strong. So it can be classified in terms of strength, predictability, as well as correlation okay what do I mean by all these factors by strength you probably already know low impact medium impact and high impact predictability what does it mean where do I write now leading indicator lagging indicator and also coincident indicator leading indicator it means that it predicts what's going to happen in the future okay lagging means that it tells you what happened in the past just like your MACD, RSI, CCI does this mean that Lagging coincident is useless, no, because central banks look at it and use this data to determine future interest rates. And also, you look at lagging and coincident to determine whether your past analysis is correct. Correlation, you have economic indicators that are positively correlated to the business cycle like i said business cycle you have expansion peak recession trough then back to expansion so when the economy expands this economic indicator will also go up will also expand so it is positively correlated to the economic cycle okay example like gdp you also have indicators that are negatively correlated to the business cycle example unemployment data when the economy expands unemployment rate is going to go down move in the opposite direction and hence it is negatively negatively correlated of course you have those that is random it doesn't move along with or against the economic cycle so how do you apply economic indicators to trade long term like i said you gotta look at absolute numbers but what's most important is the percentage change and also the trend for the past few months okay is it above or below expectations Okay, then you compile all the important economic indicators and then determine in overall does it tell you that the currency is going to go up or go down and then based on that determine how is it going to affect not only the currency but also future future monetary policies and also fiscal policies now why is it so important to look at the trend because very important you gotta look at overall big picture because certain economic data can be distorted by 
seasonal factors, temporary factors, for example, retail sales. Retail sales in December is going to be higher than usual because why? Is it because more people have jobs? Not so much because people are spending money for Christmas. So that's why you cannot look at one month data, two month data, few weeks data, one day data because it's just not representative enough. Econ indicators, there are a lot of them, like way too many. You realize that they are all interlinked. It's a chicken and egg thing, but to make things simple for you, trade balance is very important, okay? Let's say a country has a trade surplus, okay? A trade surplus, which means that exports are more than imports. The current account, okay, which involves export imports, let's just assume that export is more than imports and hence that's a trade surplus, okay? Trade surplus in general tends to benefit local businesses, okay? They are going to have more money, right? So what they're gonna do is that they are going to invest some of that money back into the business and hence they can produce more, okay? So they're going to increase production activities and also they're going to hire more people. And hence, employment rate increases. When employment rate increases, this increases consumer confidence. So this leads to increase in economic output, okay? Things like retail sales is going to increase. There will be a lot of money in the economy, flowing in the economy. And hence, inflation is going to gradually increase because a lot of demand is chasing a limited supply of goods. So this leads to inflation increasing, right? Now, inflation is not a bad thing because it is needed for the economy to grow, the country to prosper. But if inflation increases by too much, the economy becomes overheated. When it becomes overheated, okay, it's going to harm businesses and people more than it helps them. So what is going to happen is that central banks are going to come in and prevent this from getting out of control. So they are going to do this by implementing monetary policy tools. I'm going to talk about this later, okay? And in this case, to control inflation, they are going to increase interest rates. Interest rates. And hence, this is going to cause the currency to go up, okay? Because when central banks increase interest rate, the currency is going to go up. When central banks cut rates, the currency is going to go down. Now, you need to understand that different countries, they might report their economic indicators differently. They might give it a different name, but most of the developed countries, they tend to place the same importance to these few indicators, okay? So these are some of the significant ones you need to take note of. First one, employment data. Okay, employment reports. Trade balance is also called balance of payment, All right? Inflation data, deflation as well. GDP, gross domestic product, ISM, manufacturing, PMI, as well as non-manufacturing PMI, which is also called Services, PMI, okay? And then, con I cannot see, right? Let me just write somewhere else. Over here, I'll just write it here, okay? Housing data, consumer and business sentiment, consumer confidence, and also TIC capital which measures capital flow as well as 
Industrial Production Index Industrial Production Index So as a beginner, I know it's quite a lot but later on I'm going to go into the more important ones GDP, inflation, trade balance as well as employment Okay, so let's focus on these Before I get into that, I want to talk to you about the fundamentals behind each currency So if you trade a currency, it's very important for you to understand what are the economic factors that drive the currency Not only what kind of indicators, technical indicators work for that currency but also what drives the country's currency Very important, okay? Always remember to keep in mind sentiment, okay? It has to be at the back of your mind because this is all kind of interlinked together, okay? Attractiveness of the country's financial market Now this is very important because Let's say for example US Their financial market, stock market, bond market is very attractive Treasury bonds, very popular among overseas investors And hence, capital is going to flow During good times, bad times It's going to flow in and out of the country And because of that The demand and supply of USD is going to change according to the changes in risk sentiment because if nobody gives a sh sh about the country's currency capital is not going to flow and hence the currency is going to move sideways it's not going to move is the stock market of that country attractive or not? is the bonds market of that country attractive or not? the country's Central Bank Mandate What is the objective of the central bank? Most central banks of developed countries tend to have the same objective Manage inflation, managing the currency and also ensure that people are employed And of course, economic indicators that move that currency in particular because not all economic indicators work for a certain country Let's say for example, because Japan is an export-oriented country okay, Their economy, their GDP depends a lot on exports Singapore too So when there's a trade imbalance, it's going to affect the country tremendously okay? But when there's a trade imbalance in the US because the GDP is not so much contributed by exports So trade balance data is not going to affect central banks that much And also every time you trade a new currency, ask yourself Is this a high yield or low yield currency? In other words, is this a risk currency? Okay, during risk on environment, capital is going to flow into that country or is this a safe haven currency? remember when I said always have sentiment at the back of your mind during bad times does capital flow to this country? you gotta know that the next thing the amount of reserves held I'll talk about this later okay, don't worry about that frequency of government Intervention or central bank intervention. How often does central bank intervene? Depends on a lot of factors, but one of the factors is is the currency pegged to a fixed regime or is it allowed to float freely via a floating? Regime because if it is packed to let's say USD, okay, the central bank would have to constantly buy sell their own currency in order for it to not go beyond the limits to which it is packed. So they are gonna intervene again and again and again if they have a fixed regime. Example: 
Hong Kong, China, Singapore. These three currencies, they are packed to a basket of currencies. Developing countries, they tend to pack their currency against a basket of currencies or one currency. And normally developed countries like US, UK, they are going to allow their currency to float freely. Also take note of the liquidity, you probably already know this already, okay? As well as economic and political stability. Now to make life easier for you, just pick the developed countries, the popular ones, US, okay, UK, you all kind of unstable recently. Who are their major trading partners? Very important. If Canada is doing well today, but then US for some reason, markets are down, then what do you think is going to happen to Canada? It's going to affect Canada's economy, all right, and hence the currency pair. That is why you got to learn correlation as well. Is the country on a trade deficit? Example, US or on a trade surplus? Example, China. And one more important thing. What do they export or import. Very important because why? Let's say for example, one of the major exports of Australia is iron ore. When iron ore prices increases, Aussie dollar is going to increase as well. So it can give you a lot of clues as to where the currency is going to go if you understand what the country export and import. Couple of things you need to know about USD. First thing first, jargons. What is it called? Green, back, or buck, one buck, two bucks, three bucks, five bucks. Five bucks for a Starbucks coffee. Everything nowadays revolve around USD. Example, commodities are priced in USD. And hence, that's why you see things like when CRB index goes up, okay, how is this going to affect dollar index? It's going to go down. All right? US has a very attractive financial market, and hence, you can expect investors are going to exchange their local currency to USD, and then USD back to local currency. So there's a lot of capital flow going on, all right? One very important thing, it is still regarded as a safe haven currency but not as safe as compared to pre-2008. During bad times, you still see people buying USD, okay? But if investors have a choice between gold, a physical safe haven, and USD, investors would prefer gold over paper currency. And like what I said just now, a lot of the currencies are packed against USD, okay? And as of now, this will change over time, okay? Partners, you know? It's just like how your partners change over time. Like you not only have one X, you have two, three, four major trading partners of US right now, China, Mexico, and like I said, Canada, and Japan, Germany, okay? So if the US is in deep shit right now, all these countries, unfortunately, is going to be dragged down. And because USD is a reserve currency, aside from Euro, you gotta pay attention to it, okay? The next thing you gotta take note of is Yen. Now, Yen is one of my favorite currencies because it provides you very good opportunities to trade during risk off and also risk off. Risk off and risk on. Environment, risk off, risk off. Third most traded currency, so, okay, it's liquid. Check. It is 
also used as a reserve currency. And like I said just now, it is an export-oriented economy. Now this is very important. I'm not gonna make it up. A very strong currency is going to affect exports. When the currency is very strong, the country won't be able to export that much because their products become very very expensive to overseas buyers. So that is why yen is very vulnerable to intervention more frequently as compared to other central banks. During bad times, it gives you a lot of good trades. Okay, so if you pair a higher yield currency, Aussie, with yen, relatively, relatively, yen has a lower interest rate as compared to Aussie. Used to have super high interest rates last time, but right now, RBA has cut interest rate. But on a relative basis, this is still higher than this. And investors still perceive that this currency is a risk currency. So let's say during a recession, a risk of environment, okay, people are going to flock to yen to buy. Okay, to buy the yen because it's seen as a safe haven. They are going to sell off a riskier currency. Alright, and hence, you would expect that when people are scared, when stock market is tanking, okay, when stock market is tanking, let's say for example it's P500, you will expect that Aussie Yen is going to go down along with S&P 500 and hence these two are positively correlated most of the time. So the major trading partners of Japan, who are they? You have US, China, South Korea, Taiwan, and Hong Kong. So just now when I talk about dollar, okay, you look at the dollar index to gauge the strength of USD, but it's not entirely representative because it measures the strength of USD against a basket of currencies, for example, Euro. Okay? But then for Yen, you can look at the FXCM Yen index, also the same thing. It measures Yen against a basket of other Currencies. So it gives you an idea of the strength and weakness of yen at this point in time. And if you realize that, I mentioned that dollar and yen are both safe havens, right? But which one is more of a safe haven? The answer would be yen. So this makes this currency pair a little bit tricky to trade. And this is what a lot of beginners trade. If it works for you, it's fine. But if you don't know anything about it, Try not to trade that. And what currency pair is this? Dollar Yen. Agree with me? Let's say if we are on a risk of environment, something bad happened, right? Capital is going to flow to both currencies. It's just a matter of, is it going to flow more to Yen or is it going to flow more to Dollar? So if you expect capital to flow to both countries is going to be more tricky. It's going to go sideways rather than a nice downtrend or a nice uptrend like Aussie Yen. Understand what I'm saying? And especially if Fed is cutting interest rate to all-time low, then the interest rate differential is very, very small, which gives you less trading opportunities as compared to other countries with higher interest rate differential. Agree with me? Now for Euro, it is used by as of now, 19 countries, okay? But you don't need to focus on all those participating countries. You just gotta focus on the key few ones, okay? So Euro is actually also used as a reserve currency. 
Alright, some people say it's gonna replace US not so soon, I believe. And like I said just now, it makes up a very significant portion of the dollar index. So you're gonna focus on Germany data because this is what is gonna move Euro. And also it is seen as a risk currency. That is why if you look at Euro Yen chart, you pair it with a risk market like S&P 500 or any stock market in the world. It's going to move in the same direction. This means that Euro tends to move in the opposite direction as compared to the dollar. So who are the major trading partners? They are US, China, UK, Switzerland. Okay, like I said, it's gonna change over time. Now, when it comes to fundamentals of each currency, there's a lot more to that. But if I continue go to go into detail, we're going to talk until midnight, until tomorrow. So if you want a more detailed separate video on that, let me know. Okay, only for supporters, not for the stupid haters. Because even if I make it, they probably can't understand. So let's talk about the important economic indicators. The first one is inflation. Okay. If you watch CNBC, Bloomberg, they talk about different kinds of inflation and sometimes it can be confusing, right? So, you have headline inflation, you have stagflation, deflation, hyperinflation, Core inflation, disinflation. What's up with all this so confusing? One by one. First thing first, the most basic thing, what is inflation? Is the increase in prices of consumer goods and services. Okay, 20 years ago, a cup of coffee is cheaper than now. That is the headline inflation. Okay? There's one problem with this. It also takes into account food and energy prices, which is very volatile. So sometimes, due to seasonal factors, okay, there's raining and all that, and it tends to cause coffee prices, example, to increase. And hence, it's going to cause this to increase, and it's not very representative. That is why people come up with core inflation which removes food and energy prices and this is what central banks like to focus on. Stagflation is a mixture, it's very confusing, it's a mixture of inflation and deflation. What does deflation mean? The opposite of inflation, a decrease in prices. Stagflation means people have no jobs, okay? But then, you go to shopping, everything is so expensive because prices increase. And this is very difficult for central banks to manage stagflation because it's like, should I increase interest rate or should I cut interest rates? And it's very confusing for consumers too. How about hyperinflation? It means an excessive increase in prices, like it's out of control. It's just that it will eventually prompt central bank to increase interest rates, okay? Disinflation is just a different term for the normal inflation. Basically, it just means that inflation still exists, but it is slowing down. So it's like, this is your Honda, okay, Honda, Lamborghini, McLaren, Ferrari, then this is your bicycle. Inflation is not really an entirely bad thing because when there's inflation, it means that the economy is growing, okay? And normally, when the economy is growing, there will be higher interest rates. The downside of it is that it might potentially lead to 
a trade deficit. Okay, and also foreign investors when they invest into that country, because the inflation is so high, so their returns get eroded. By the time they bring the profits back to their country, it's very little money. And of course, inflation it reduces the value of your money. So when inflation gets out of control, central banks they are gonna come in and do things. Okay, for example, they are going to increase interest rates. So that businesses will borrow less and consumers will be encouraged to save money. So this decreases the money supply in the economy. Or they could implement deflationary fiscal policy. What does this mean? Example, increase taxes. Or they are going to buy or sell the currency, currency intervention. Or they're gonna invest more into technology and make people more productive. Let's call it productivity projects. Basically, some people call this the supply side policy. The good thing about this is that it wouldn't affect the trade balance. Okay, can you see? Supply side policies. So for inflation, you look at CPI, Consumer Price Index, okay? And you look at the core CPI, which excludes food and energy prices. And for the business side, you look at Producer Price Index, PPI. Basically, PPI is just almost the same thing. It measures the prices of goods and services produced by producers, okay, the manufacturers. Then this is the price of the stuff we as consumers buy. You see a difference? So to put it simply, when there's inflation, it means that there is a lot of, there's a lot of money flowing in the economy, right? Money supply is very high. Okay, a lot of money flowing in the economy. This will cause the currency to to depreciate. On the other hand, when there's a decrease in money supply, okay, when there's a decrease in money supply, the currency is gonna appreciate, okay? And who's responsible for money supply? Central banks. Some people would say that central banks, they are independent people. I don't need to depend on nobody, but in real fact, central banks, would act on behalf of the government directly or indirectly okay and a couple of things you need to know when you study a central bank first thing first what are their objectives their mandate second thing who are the key persons who whenever they say or do something it's going to move the markets, okay? And their biases, are they more biased towards increasing interest rates, hawkish or dovish decreasing interest rates? Also, of course, take note of when interest rate announcements are released, okay? How much gold and currency reserves does this central bank has we, we reserve reserves okay and like what I said just now what are their responsibilities what are their objectives managing inflation managing the money supply of a country as well as the currency exchange rate the government is responsible for fiscal policy central banks they are responsible for monetary policy so we are classified into economic policy, okay? You have monetary policy as well as fiscal policies. So if you have watched my previous video, you know that monetary policies, you have expansionary monetary policy and also contractionary monetary policy. Same for fiscal policies. But what are some of the different tools that 
central banks have. They can influence commercial banks to change their reserve ratio. So if they increase the reserve requirements, they are telling commercial banks to please keep more money in your vaults, bank vaults. And because they have to keep more money inside their banks, this stack of cash cannot be lent to borrowers and hence there's less money available for people, for consumers and hence it will decrease the money supply in the economy. And of course, they can change interest rates, interest rates, and then also they can perform open market operations. Basically, it's the buying and selling of government securities. When central bank buy bonds, the money supply increases and hence the interest rates would decrease and when they sell those bonds money supply is going to decrease and hence interest rate is going to increase basically the objective of buying and selling bonds is to influence the interest rates okay as you know yields is inversely proportional to bond prices so when bond prices increase yields are going to decrease and the other way around they can also influence the fed funds rate like i said just now they can intervene buy sell the currency something more common nowadays so-called money printing nowadays because everything is electronic they don't really print money they're just gonna key in a couple of zeros into the balance sheet and that's it as well as we purchase agreements or some people call it repos so one very common term that is used is fed funds rate discount rate base rate, reserve rate. So what are all these terms? Let's say these are all commercial banks, okay? And this is the Fed. This is the Fed. Those commercial banks with excess reserves, okay? They can lend it to another commercial bank at a cheap rate. And this very cheap rate is called Fed funds rate, okay? It's the same thing with interest rates. If it is increased, if the Fed funds rate is increased, then the cost of borrowing is very expensive and hence, less people will borrow money and hence, less money will flow into the economy and hence, less money supply. Central bank, some people call the central bank lender of last resort. Because if you as a commercial bank wants to borrow from the central bank, the Fed, okay, you borrow at this rate called a discount rate. And if you are a stocks investor, you do your discounted cash flow, you project your current estimated profits into the future and then you discount it back to the present values this is what they use, discount rate, okay, to find out what is the intrinsic value of the stock. That's for another topic. Discount rate is hence more expensive as compared to Fed funds rate. Why is discount rate more expensive than Fed funds rate? Because they want to encourage banks to lend to each other. Don't you come and borrow from me? So if they run out of reserves, there's no more choices, then they would have to borrow from the Fed and discount rate has its function, has its use. Fed funds rate is also very important to professional traders. Why is that? Because professional traders, for them to so-called predict what the future interest rates is going to be, they look at 
Fed funds, futures. Okay, Fed funds, futures. How do you read the Fed funds, futures chart? Now, for beginners, it's gonna be a little bit overwhelming, but it's easier than you think. You realize that when the Fed funds rate is, let's say, 1%, then the Fed funds future graph is way at the top. Fed funds rate decreases, the Fed fund futures chart increases. Why is that? Because let's say Fed funds rate right now is 1%. Okay? So you take 100 minus 1%, this gives you 99. Because the formula goes like this 100 minus Fed funds rate. So this means that if traders perceive that, okay, Fed in the future, they are going to increase interest rates. They are going to short the Fed funds futures. If they perceive that they are going to cut rates, then they are going to buy Fed funds futures. So basically, expansionary fiscal policy and don't mind the construction noise. Basically, expansionary monetary policy is used to increase the money supply. Okay, it means that it is used to stimulate the economy. So how do you stimulate the economy? You cut interest rates. So for contractionary or deflationary monetary policy, central banks are going to increase interest rates. Okay, to slow down the inflation rate. So normally for expansionary policies, it is used when times are bad, okay? So for fiscal policies, this includes cutting taxes as well as increase in spending, government expenditure or government spending, okay? So government is going to spend more money on infrastructure and resources, invest into people, into society so that people are going to start spending money again. Then deflationary is the other way around. Increase taxes and a decrease in government spending. Normally this is done when the economy is sort of overheating. So they want to discourage people from spending money. So where does the government get all this money to spend on resources? Couple of ways, it's just like you and me, the typical consumer, okay? We can borrow money, okay? Or we can use our savings. So government normally, they would have reserves from the past few years. And then when there's a crisis, they are going to spend it. You can escape everything, but you cannot escape taxes. You tax people. Okay, so when we pay taxes, this becomes a revenue for the government. And also foreign grants and aids, if they can't get that, they are going to issue short-term bonds, medium-term bonds, and long-term bonds. So the next thing we're going to talk about is the important economic indicators. Basically, the employment situation report. Okay. You just gotta know this, it consists of the establishment survey and household survey. And there are a lot of different types of data inside. So let's just make life simple for you, okay? Let's just focus on NFP as well as unemployment. A lot of retail traders don't understand how this is computed. They tend to believe whatever that is released. First thing first, like I said just now, employment number is one of the most political numbers out there. Okay? Because if you're a politician, you will want to make sure that people are happy. So what makes people satisfied enough to vote for you again? One of those factors is whether they are doing well financially. Unemployment data. It tells you the amount of people who are actively looking for jobs, but they are jobless, okay? 
This means that people who has given up on the job search are not included. But are they jobless? Yeah. The amount of people who are unemployed is supposed to be, let's say, 100,000. But then they report 5,000. So that's why we don't rely on just one number to determine the overall long-term direction. Because sometimes it can cheat you just like candlesticks. But it can give you a little bit of indication as to when a recession is gonna come, okay? But another economic indicator that you can look at is the part-time employment data. Because here's the thing, when companies are not doing well, not only are they going to retrench people, okay? They are going to cut costs and all that, but if they do hire, they are going to hire part-time staff first to be safe because it's cheaper. So part-time employment, if it increases, it can give you an indication that, okay, maybe, maybe a recession is going to come. But again, it is not guaranteed because it is also subjected to seasonal factors. Let's say summertime, summertime school holidays is here. The amount of people who take up part-time jobs is going to increase because college kids, they have nothing to do during the holidays. They are going to take up part-time work. Agree with me? But for the past many recessions, it has shown that during a recession or before the recession, people who take up part-time jobs is going to increase. How about NFP? I already talked about this in a previous video, so I'm not going to say much about it. But just remember that this is not, this is not a leading indicator. It lags behind the economy. But why do we still pay attention to it? Because the Fed central banks look at NFP. Okay. Okay, next very important econ indicator is GDP. Basically, it measures the market value of goods and services in a particular year. Now, certain countries provide year-on-year -year data. Okay, certain countries, they provide month-on-month -month data. Basically, it measures the state of the economy, the economic health and economic growth. So when GDP is positive, economy is growing. When it's negative, economy is contracting. And there's two types you need to take note of, nominal GDP as well as real GDP. So when GDP increases, it means that people are well off, agree with me? But then if you look at the GDP formula, how it is calculated is output times multiplied by prices. Output meaning the amount of stuff produced times the price. So that's one problem. It is absolutely possible that a country produces the same amount of stuff every single year and then the prices increase. Then when you look at GDP data, it increased. Not because the country produces more stuff, but because prices increase. So there's a problem. When prices increase, people aren't well off because shit is expensive. In order to remove this issue, we look at real GDP. So we only take into account output, prices remain stable. We'll take a base year, a base year price, and this remains constant. To put things in simple terms, real GDP is a better measure of whether the economy is growing or not, whether people are well off or not. It's the same thing with interest rates and real interest rates. It doesn't let inflation affect the outcome of the data. GDP data, there are also some issues. That's why you cannot rely on one number alone. It measures the market value of goods and services, right? But it doesn't include certain things. Example, if I'm a book seller, but I don't just sell any book. I wanna be cheap. I mean, I wanna 
make things affordable to people. So, what I do is that I'm gonna sell secondhand books instead. Does this contribute to GDP? If I sell secondhand stuff, no, it doesn't. If I am a housewife and I'm lazy to go to the grocery store to buy fruits, so I'm gonna plant my own fruits, not rely on low supermarket. I plant those fruits, then I eat it. Does that contribute to GDP? No, it doesn't. Self-produced stuff doesn't contribute to GDP, even though it makes me cheaper. I mean, it makes me happier because I save money, right? Doesn't contribute to GDP. And the other things I wouldn't mention, like underground transactions. So it's not entirely representative. Agree with me? Like if I'm completely self-sufficient, I don't contribute to GDP at all. I can fix my own car, I can grow my own foods, I can make my own plane. So how can a country improve their GDP? First thing first, you gotta look at the formula, okay? It's very easy, okay? It's just equals to consumption plus, there's no more ink, damn it, investment government spending balance of trade basically trade balance okay so how can a country improve their gdp just increase any of these components encourage people to spend more increase the productivity of workers invest more in equipment and plants properties, government has to spend more on facilities for people. Aside from nominal GDP, real GDP, you also gotta look at these two. Debt to GDP as well as GDP per capita. A country that has more people. Common sense tells us that it's going to be higher than a country with lower amount of population. Agree with me? So because this takes into account the population and hence it will be more representative okay so this is very useful if you want to compare between different countries like you're trading many different currencies and you want to compare between different countries then you should look at this and debt to gdp okay if it is very high then it tells us that it is bad for the country's economy, but it is not entirely a bad thing. You realize that countries with high debt to GDP, they would compensate this number with an increase in interest rates. So normally they would have a higher interest rate as compared to other countries with lower debt to GDP. Because why? Higher interest rate, it tends to attract investors. When the yields are high, it's going to attract investors to invest into that country. So this would give investors a reason to invest into this country that has high debt to GDP. So trade balance, very important as well. It is a measure of importing and exporting activities. Assume everything remains constant. When a country has a trade surplus, okay, it is good for the currency. When the currency has a trade deficit, meaning imports are more than exports, meaning I buy more stuff than I sell. Us personally, when we buy more than we earn, there's gonna be some issues. Your wife's gonna divorce you. Imports more than exports, bad for currency. Whereas for trade surplus, I sell more than I buy. Okay, so my exports are more than imports. Does this mean that if I import more than I export, then it's guaranteed to be bad for the currency? Not so much because if you look at what 
the trade balance consists of it consists of two accounts. First account, capital account, which measures capital flow, and then you have current account. which measures trade, okay, your regular import exports of stuff, goods and services, okay? So this means that countries with a trade deficit, okay, let's say for example US, they have a negative current account balance, they will compensate it with increasing capital inflows. So when they have a deficit, it doesn't mean that it's a bad thing because they might be borrowing from overseas and then they are focusing on investing locally which is going to benefit the country in the long term that is why US market is still attractive to foreign investors despite the fact that for many many years US has been running a trade deficit that is why capital account is also known as the financial account because it measures the flow of paper assets like stocks and one aspect that is related to capital account is, like what I said just now, the amount of reserves. Why is this so important? Because central banks, they would use reserves, can be in the form of gold, can be in the form of currency, USD, Euro, Pound, to intervene in the markets, okay? So they are going to use their reserves to weaken or strengthen the currency. So this is why you gotta take note of the amount of reserves because the more reserves a central bank has, the more resources they have to intervene and hence the chances of them intervening. Disturbing the currency is going to increase. So these are some of the things that professional traders need to pay attention to. These are just on the surface things. There are a lot more details that you need to learn. That is why the typical professional trader takes at least three years to master everything. They gotta go through intensive training. I myself went through three years of finance school, then visiting investment banks, talking to professional traders. I can tell it's a lot to digest if you want to trade just like the professional traders it's not going to be easy but it's going to be worth it okay if you want a part 3 part 4 of this course with more details let me know okay and I'll try my best to deliver it to you and I just want to say one thing is that I want to thank you for supporting me all this way because without your support I probably would have stopped teaching a long time ago I'll put part 1 and intermarket analysis somewhere over here on this screen. So with that, talk to you in the next video. Bye.